As you know, every good thing is eventually ends, so we come to the end of this course at least. But uh, I'm sure that you are just beginning to see the questions, <laughs> maybe some of the answers of the... I was trying to flood you with a lot of uh, information on many different topics, and all of them require some extension. I hope you at least know that. <laughs> so it's nothing that we taught here is complete, and it's never complete. But there is one complete subject that we hardly touched, and I want to cover it, <laughs> to give you a, a very short, uh, condensed preview of what we call computational learning theory. Uh, and how com I, uh, uh, but before that, I just want to, to summarize again something I didn't have the chance to tell you in the last class. So again, Shannon theory for us is essentially, what you should remember is the, are these two pictures. You have the distortion measure, and you have the rate of transmission, and you have a, a capacity which has some cost. So there's some uh, two, two functions, fun the two fundamental questions, the two fundamental uh, quantities in information theory are, are just uh, the rate distortion trade off and so there's a function R of D what is the minimal rate of information that I need to send through the channel in order to achieve a certain average distortion. Uh, and this is a downgoing uh, concave function like this. Now, where the, uh, I usually assume that zero distortion means lossless. But it depends, of course. So the, the, this point is the entropy of the source, the entropy rate of the source. And usually, when the distortion becomes very large, the, the rate becomes very small. And with infinite distortion, I don't need any information. <laughs> That's usually the, the picture. Sometimes the distortion is bounded, so it can come to, to zero at some finite distortion. OK. So what is the distortion function? As I said, I mean, this distortion is a, is a measure of similarity, a measure of how well, how much I'm willing to distort my, uh, my, uh, my patterns. Uh, so there is a distortion function, and this distortion function is, is essentially arbitrary. Uh, I mean, it, it can be you know the Euclidean distance between two vectors, or the Hamming distance, or the or the, you know, the distortion of speech, or distortion of video, or distortion of images. I mean, every domain and every type of question has a different relevant distortion function. So this is very much domain dependent. Okay, so this is where all the physics of the problem, in some sense, or part of the physical problem comes into the game, and it becomes as complicated as you want, in principle, to find the right distortion function for a certain problem. What is the right distortion function for distorting text, or what is the right distortion function for distorting images? So, you know, think just about text. I mean, I can say the same things with exactly the same meaning with completely different words, okay? Uh, and so if you look just you know, at the distance between the, the words or the letters, you don't get go, go anything. Uh, and actually, th these two sentences can be very close because they say essentially the same. So it depends where you, in what space, in what, in what uh, level of abstraction you actually want to measure your distortion. And, and uh, the same is true about activities in the brain. I mean, the same idea, whatever that means, can, can, can look in my, my brain very different than in your brain, and we still have exactly the same, the same perception, whatever that means. So again, so those perceptual, so the distortion function is a big, big headache. Uh, and actually, so as I said, I mean, we are trying in many ways to get rid of it. I mean, to, to put some, to, to put some sort of universal distortion or fundamental distortion, which really captures everything that we're interested in. But that's, you know, that's the holy grail of. Uh, of science in general, maybe, but certainly in neuroscience or <laughs> cognitive science. I mean, uh, what is it? Uh, what is there? Some sort of universal distortion function. So actually, I, I claim that there is, and actually, it's very close to the KL divergence of some distributions. But I'm just pushing by that 
the questions to a different place. I mean, it's not the distortion function, it's the probability distribution <laughs> that is going to capture the structure of the problem and so on. So this is, this is a ghost. I mean, <laughs> this is something we are all after, but it's, it's never entirely fulfilled. And the second question is what I call the cost. So again, this is a physical entity. Something like the, the energy or, the, or some metabolic cost. I mean, when we talk about the uh, communication in the brain or anything like this, then we usually think about the various types of cost of communication. I mean, sometimes it's just the energy, or sometimes it's the, the cost in calcium, or the cost in, uh, in, uh, in uh, dopamine, or I don't know what. I mean, there are many, many things that are involved in, in, in activity of the brain, and each one of them has its own measure, and, and so it's cost, the cost is also very, so the distortion I said is actually a very tricky thing, and the cost is also tricky. <laughs> it depends on the problem. So, so this can be things like energy, it's a very popular cost, that can be uh, any kind of metabolic cost. So whatever we mean by metabolic is up to you. <laughs> Things that we need in order to survive. Oxygen, calcium, uh, whatever. And, and, uh, and uh, so you know, so this, this is again complicated. <laughs> but the beauty of information theory is that tells us whatever you, y your cost of transmission is, or your cost of communication is, the capacity as a function of the cost goes up in some monotonic way. So, so there is this function, the rate of D and C of E. So, and, and once, so essentially what Shannon did, and I really believe that this is the most uh, elegant part of the story of Shannon, is that in order to communicate what you really want to know is what is the cost of a given distortion function. Okay? So, uh, what is how much oxygen I need in order to give this lecture? <laughs> okay? So, this is uh, give this lecture in a way that you understand. Okay? <laughs> so, so, the distortion is your uh, perception of my ideas, <laughs> and the cost is my uh, level of uh, oxygen in the blood or adrenaline or whatever it is. <laughs> so, you know, so this is a very hard question in general. Extremely hard, and it can be as hard as you want. But Shannon tells us, no, there are actually two functions. One of them is this C of E, which is the maximum mutual information across the channel, subject to a, a, around X such that the cost, the expected, so PX, uh, the cost of a certain letter, this sum, is less than this cost. Okay, so this is now turning this very abstract question into a very simple looking variational problem. I need to maximize the information across the channel and nothing else matters. As long as you can solve this, this constraint optimization, maximize the communication capacity subject to your cost constraint, which can be very complicated. If this cost constraint is indeed some sort of an expectation as I wrote here, so there's a cost for every message that I send, and, and now I, I, I want to minimize the expected cost. And, and this is nothing but, uh, and there's another function, this R of D, which is essentially the minimum of I between W and its representation, and uh, the code words, subject to minimum over all the possible maps from W to W map, subject to this distortion constraint. Okay? So these are, these are the two concrete functional problems or optimization problems that Shannon formulated for us. Yeah? Can you explain the Yeah, so in principle, if you pay more, you get more. I mean, that's, a <laughs> that's the standard utility, utility uh <laughs> You, you want something better, you should pay more. So when I give you more energy, I can, I can transmit with higher capacity. And of course, I didn't have time to show it, but the standard Gaussian channel, as you call it, where the noise is simply an additive noise, uh, then it's the signal-to-noise ratio of the message. I mean, the ratio between the power of the signal to the power of the noise. So in, in, the, in, in, in the, the typical example of cost-capacity problem is the 
capacity of the of the, ch the Gaussian channel, which is essentially half log one plus the SNR. So we all do know what SNR, the signal to noise ratio, the power signal to noise ratio, which is the, the mean power of the transmission divided by the mean power of the noise. So in this case, E is simply the power, the energy of the transmission. And the noise is the noise, the, the power of the noise, the variance of the noise. So in this case, you see it's a, it's a logarithmic function, which means it's a concave up with concave function. It is zero when SNR is zero. Okay? But as long as I have a positive uh, SNR, even very small, I get, I get some capacity. So this is the capacity of the Gaussian channel, and that's what you should have in mind when I talk about cost capacity trade off. So in general, for any channel, I mean, tomorrow you may want to calculate the capacity of some uh, channel in the brain or between neurons, or I don't know what. You should ask yourself, okay, what is the cost, re the relevant cost? So it may be, you know, a certain neurotransmitter which is uh, important, or a certain uh, molecule which is important, or a certain energy, ATP, ADP, I don't know what. All sorts of things that we need in order to, 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 to survive. <laughs> So essentially, this cost, as I said, can be a very complicated thing, but in the simplest, almost the simplest case, it's a function of the SNR. It's the SNR of something. <laughs> it may be the SNR of energy, it may be the SNR of molecule concentration, it may be the SNR of some other thing that you measure. So this is the typical, the typical type of phase. To call. So this is essentially the energy, yeah, the energy ratio. Now, uh, it's uh, so, so in general, if I give you more, <laughs> if you can think about the cost as money, you know, as uh, we usually do, uh, uh, <laughs> we think about costs. I give you more money, you can get better channels. Okay, <laughs> you want more bits per second at your home, you you should pay more to someone. <coughs> of course, you can find another company which may give it to you cheaper, but that's a different story. <laughs> okay, so so yes. Um, so why this is true? What's the question? So, okay, so, so last time that's exactly what I didn't have time to complete. That's why I'm spending a few minutes on it. So I showed you that this capacity is governed by the information because of, those, of, of the pecking problem. I mean, I want to peck spheres in this large space of entropy, and so it, it's, it's going to be the maximum number of non-overlapping spheres, if you remember where the noise is just expanding the entropy. So in this abstract space, this problem is boiled down to what we call pecking problem. How many spheres of certain size you can peck in, 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 in H? And so this was 2 to the n H, and, and this was 2 to the n uh, uh, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, this was 2 to the n H Y and this was H Y given X in the, in the channel coding problems. So essentially, it's a maximum because I want to maximize the number of words that I can pack here without overlap, without errors. Okay, so that's why this is a maximum information problem because it's, a, it's essentially a packing problem. This is what we call in general a packing problem trying to pack together as many as many oranges as I can in my <laughs> or whatever without squishing them. <laughs> okay without generating uh, orange juice so essentially uh, this is a pecking problem it's a very famous type of problem in mathematics I mean how do you pack spheres in an at the maximum level without overlap okay now so what are these yeah I said last time so each, each word is mapped to a sphere here and this is 2 to the n h y given x, this is 2 to the n, where n is the size of the block, essentially, h x, h y. So remember, I'm, I'm sending not one message, I'm sending a lot of messages, and I pack them together. So this is what we call the block length. And this block length, the, the larger the block, the closer I am to the, to the tight bound, but I'm paying with delay. So that's when I say asymptotically, it's in this block length. I mean, what is the number of messages I'm going to send together? And only then I can get close to the bounds in general. Especially if you can do it actually without it. And then, as I said, this problem is a minimum information problem. No, so, so these are the absolute bounds. I mean, this is the maximum capacity, the maximum bits per second you can send through the channel at a given cost. So give me the cost, this is the maximum number. Okay? 
you give me less, you want to pay less, you, you'll get only this, and so on. Okay? Now, essentially, this is the minimal rate that I need in order to assemble a certain, certain distortion. So again, you tell me how much you're willing to spend, what is your budget, and I'll tell you, I'll go here, I compare now information to information, actually information rate to information rate. But these, these two axes have the same dimensions. It's all measures in information. Now. Where this E and D can be crazy things, anything you want. So there's no way, I mean, if I look at the ED, the ED trade-off, probably there's also some function here. It can be very complicated. But I don't know. What, I, what is easy to calculate is the C of E and R of D trade-off. So essentially, you give me the budget, I'll calculate the, the capacities I can buy for this budget, and then I'll see, you know, the, and the condition was, of course, as I said many times, was R of D, condition for reliable communication, is that my rate is smaller than the capacity. If this is not obeyed, then I cannot communicate without errors. Okay, so the best that I can do, so if this is your budget, this is the minimum rate, the maximum rate that you can buy, which means that this is the, distor the minimal distortion you're going to suffer. Okay, so that's how these two things work together. Of course, now you can ask all sorts of interesting questions, like what if I don't know the distribution, or what if I don't have a simple point-to-point -point communication, or what if I have memory in my channel? I mean, there are all sorts of information theory is all about playing with all sorts of variations of this question. And that's what we're going to learn if you take a course in information theory. <laughs> what happens if there is a, this type of channel or another type of channel, there's some network communication, or you know, now uh, the channel is adaptive. For example, now we are talking about communication through the internet. The communication through the internet is actually a very complicated channel because my packets, my, my information packets can go through many ways. <laughs> And uh, it's actually a network communication problem. And I, I can send one packet goes through this, and another packet goes through this. And so I can talk about the total capacity, let's say, between me and some, I don't know, Netflix. <laughs> and this actually can be a very complicated communication problem. But in principle, it's just an extension of this type of problem. And of course, the more interesting question in information theory are the questions which, are, which don't assume that I know the probability distribution. So here, I actually assume that I know my probability of the source. But then I could calculate the capacity, uh, the, the entropy, and, the, and I know the distortion function. But what if I don't know the distribution? Or what if I don't know the distribution of the channel? Here I assume that I know Px, Py given x, which is the channel. What if I don't? So this, this takes us to what we call in information theory universal uh, compression schemes. So things which essentially what they do is try to learn the statistic of the channel or the source during the transmission. So, so a classical uh, example of a universal coding, for example, is what we call lempel ziv or ziv lempel lempel ziv is, uh, we, you know, in Israel, we're very proud of this thing because it came out of Israel, but it's, it's essentially a very, a very common one of the standards in compression, and it has many, many extensions and versions. So when you're doing zip to your data uh, in, on your computer or something like this, compress it in some way or another, you're actually using some sort of universal compression schemes, which essentially, they don't assume the, the statistics, they just learn it by a nice trick, uh, which is this algorithm, but the, it's slow. I mean, so it takes very long blocks in order to actually get close to the true entropy. And there are similar things about adaptive channels. I, mean, I don't know the channel, I'm trying to use the code, which is going to get, it's trying to extend the complexity as long as I don't get get uh, errors. So this type of adaptive channels usually requires some sort of feedback. I mean, I need to know how well my message is received, or, uh, and, and if, if I have feedback in my channel, then Shannon proved actually that just a simple feedback is not going to help you much, but if you have also memory in your channel, then it's getting uh, extremely complicated. And then these are really the, the hardest problems in information theory are calculating the capacity of channels with feedback and memory. But these are precisely the kind of thing that we are interested in uh, in, in cognitive science or in neuroscience. <laughs> these are always channels with some sort of feedback and some sort of memory. Yeah. Okay. Now, why this is a minimum information problem and this is a maximum information problem? Because here I'm doing packing, 
And here, and this is again something I didn't quite complete, here is actually, I'm storing the patterns, I'm covering my space with spheres which are not too distorted. Okay? So here I want them to be non-overlapping. Here I don't care about the overlap, but I want the minimum number of spheres that will cover my space with a certain distortion. And as I said last time, this is exactly equivalent to minimizing information because subject to this distortion constraint. So this is why this problem looks like a covering problem. I want to cover a space with the minimum number of spheres since the size. And this looks like a pecking problem. And these two problems, pecking and covering, are what we call in mathematics dual. In some sense, where they meet, it's essentially the same thing. So the most highly pecked, and the, the, the maximum number I can peck without, without overlap, or the minimum number I need, to, I can cover without, without uh, missing anything, are essentially the same. So this is where you see the duality of this problem, very nicely. <coughs> this is a maximum information problem, this is a minimum information problem. Now if you remember, and you shouldn't, but if you remember what I said about the bottleneck problem, I said very little, but it has actually both ingredients. I mean, I'm minimizing one information, which is the source coding problem, and actually maximizing the other information, which is, so you're trying to match the source and the channel together simultaneously. And that's what actually happens in, in biology, as I said. I mean, we, we adapt the channels to our sources, or we adapt the sources to our channels. That's why we communicate eventually very effectively. OK, so that's the end of this story. <laughs> yes? The small d? Yeah, you need the distribution of, uh, of w hat such that the small d. Yeah, yeah. So I need also, I need uh, for the ray distortion problem, I need both the source distribution and the distortion function. And then I can cut and I can average it. So this average is nothing like but sum over all W and W D, W hat, P of W and W hat, which is P of W <coughs> times P of W hat given W. And w hat given W was the thing I'm optimizing over. Uh, sum over this times the distortion. Okay, so this is just another expectation. Here, I'm optimizing over the source distribution where the channel is given. This is given. And here, I'm actually, the source is given and I'm optimizing over the encoding, the, the compression. So that's why this is a minimum and this is a maximum and both of them have a unique solution, which is nice because I showed you, or maybe you show, saw it in one of the exercises, that I is convex with respect to the P and then concave with respect to the P here. That's exactly why it's important. So this has a clear maximum, and this has a clear minimum. And actually, the algorithms for finding it, which I'm not going to get into, the iterative algorithms of, for solving these two problems. So again, here I assume the source is given, and the distortion function is known. Here I assume that the channel is given, and I can play with the probability of my using the channel. How? What are the frequency of settings? So it's this probability which o over which I maximize under this constraint. Okay, that's, so this, this is all I want you all to remember about information theory. <laughs> if you get this, the rest will follow. <laughs> I mean, it's not that you know everything, but you know where to start asking interesting questions. Okay, so now I, I put this chapter away. Of course, if you have questions, this is the time to ask them. And I'm going to talk about really, let me just close the door. So I just, I, I want to do some sort of really crash uh, preview. Review of uh, what we call computational learning theory, which uh, actually should be also so, uh, called statistical learning theory. It's, for me, it is the same thing uh, for psychologists, uh, cognitive psychologists, where they, call, where they say statistical learning, 
actually have something slightly different in mind, but it's the that's that's the real thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, so this is a, a relatively new uh, field. It's not so new anymore because it was more or less invented in statistics and in computer science in the 80s, whereas information theory is from the 40s. So it has uh, about 40 years. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but they really uh, but the idea here was let's try to have uh, what you call a computational theory try to, to, to talk about the needs in terms of cycles of computers, of time of computation, and the need in terms of not data that I need. So essentially the two things which computer science usually care about are not necessarily, in information theory, this is an asymptotic theory, <laughs> in the sense that I, I, I care about accuracy or probability of error in my transmission, and I care about uh, bits per second, I mean, a rate of communication, but I don't care about how long does it take me to learn it or to achieve it. I mean, so delays, for example, could be an infinite. <laughs> I don't care. The information theory doesn't care about computational time or time in general in, in the sense that how much it's going to cost me to actually achieve this optimized. Computer science, we care very much about time. I mean, the, the cost of computation. How much time does it take? So this shifts the emphasis to a slightly different type of question but they are related. So essentially, in computational learning theory, we start formally with the following uh, assumption. So there is uh, some sort of an X, which I want to call the input space, or the instant space, space, or you know, the, this is the probability over, over which I'm, I'm actually, it's just like the probability space. Right? The instance of probability, I'm going to draw some events from this subset of this distribution. And, uh, the, and uh, the assumption is that I'm getting, a, 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 so there is a, I'm talking about labels of supervised learning, so there is a, an output space or labels so in, in, in the context of uh, labels. So this, for example, this can be an image, and this can be the name of the person. Or, or is it the face, or is it, uh, you know, the same type of problem. This is the kind of thing they are talking about in supervised learning. In what you call unsupervised learning, the problem is slightly different. It's much less uh, well-defined. I mean, so I'm, I'm giving uh, images or, or something, and I want to combine them together according to similarity. Uh, and then, of course, I need something else, which is something like a distortion function. I need some similarity measure between our objects. So in supervised, this is supervised learning now. And I'm sure you heard most of it uh, one way or another in other places. Net in neural networks, I don't know where. <laughs> so it's, it's going to look familiar. But now uh, the emphasis, OK, so I'm getting a sample. I'm getting a sample. This is the same object that we talked about all the time. And this sample is, is some sort of, I call it S of M, which is nothing more than a pair, a, a sequence of pairs, X1, Y1, labeled, labeled data. So for each, so for each uh, pattern I'm getting its label. This is in the case of supervised learning. This label may be accurate or non-accurate. It can be noisy. It can be all sorts of things. Okay. And I may get partially labeled, and I, I, I may get some data, some patterns with the label, some other patterns without the label. So this will be partially labeled or semi-supervised. There are all sorts of variations on this thing. Okay. Now, the point is that I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm interested in an algorithm, which is a computational procedure, which takes the sample and generates what you call an hypothesis for the rule. So there is underlying what connects these two things is some function. So, so I know that y can be some function of x in general. Uh, so for example, it can be something which I know. So this function, or sometimes we call it concept of x, uh, this actually, w w so I, I, I must assume usually something about the functions. If I don't assume anything, if the function can be arbitrary, then I'm in a situation which in a learning theory we like to call the to remind everyone what we call the no-free-lunch theorem. I don't know if you heard about it. 
So it's actually a, some sort of a joke, but it's a real <laughs> theorem. So, so the no free lunch theorem tells you that if you don't assume anything about your function class, you're never going to learn. But what do we mean by learning? So without some assumptions about your, your, the function that you're trying to learn, you can't learn. Okay, so, so this is what we call the concept class. Now the concept class is not really important, as we are going to see. What is important is that I have an algorithm. So the algorithm, I, let's denote it by A, and this algorithm, the learn, what we call the learning algorithm, is getting the sample. And actually has something which we eventually want to call the hypothesis class. So, so the algorithm is a subroutine, <laughs> a computer program that you are writing. And it gets as input, whether explicitly or implicitly, a, an hypothesis class, which is the kind of functions that this algorithm can generate. So it slides somewhere. And the training data, which is those labeled points. And it generates, the algorithm is generating what we call hypotheses. 1H, which is an uh, some function in my class, which means, f given this hypothesis, I have a function y even h of x. Okay? The, note, uh, the concept class is the real... Yeah, so the concept class is, is some assumption about where <laughs> my function can come from. But, of course, okay. So now that we see that there is some uh, mismatch, or some potential mismatch between my concept class and my hypothesis class. By the way, how many of you heard about it? One way or another. <laughs> Not that many. Hmm. Okay, so of course, what I'm doing now is, is, is squeezing a course of a semester into one hour <laughs> with very high compression. <laughs> but I'm just trying to give you, if you really want to learn it, you should try to hear a course like uh, Introduction to Machine Learning, IML, in, in Computer Science, or any other version of this course. Uh, we're having actually quite a few <coughs> learning theory courses in, in Jerusalem and all sorts of var variants and vari <laughs> But this IML is probably the, or if, you, if you're really good at reading books, you can take the excellent textbook uh, of uh, Shai Shalev Shvat and Shai Ben David. Uh, this is just essentially the lecture notes of his course. Uh, there are many other books. Actually, I find this book a little bit, uh, it's actually a very good book, but it's, it's not the whole story. <laughs> there are many things that are not there. It's called uh, Understanding Machine Learning or something you can easily find. So what I'm saying is just to give you the, the flavor and the connection of this type of ideas to what we talked about in the course. Okay. Okay, so hypothesis, the, the algorithm is able to generate some functions, not all possible functions. For example, it can generate hyperplanes, or it can generate uh, polynomials of some degree. Or it can generate, uh, I don't know, Fourier function with some bounded uh, Fourier transform. Bounded, that's what's called band limited functions. Or things like this. I mean. So every algorithm has, as, as I said, implicitly or explicitly, better be explicit. I mean, we know what the hypothesis class that this algorithm is able to generate. And essentially, what the algorithm is trying to do is to generate a good approximation to the rule which we call the hypothesis that the, the algorithm generates. So the, the output of the algorithm is an hypothesis in my class in most cases. If we do what we call proper learning, or it can be some sort of mixture over hypothesis, but if we do Bayesian type of learning, but that's a different story. Okay, so now how do you want to evaluate if this is a good, uh, a good hypothesis? So this is what we call H is the hypothesis class. Class. So the concept class is the pos all possible functions that I may occur, <laughs> which is usually something you don't really know when you do real, uh, real data learning, but it's a, uh, I just define it, and you're going to see the concept class is not going to be very important. The concept class is going to play the role, the important role here. Yeah? Sorry? It sounds like they are both just other Yeah, so H is all the functions the algor this algorithm can, can, can generate, okay? It's, it's a function of the algorithm. And C is all the functions that I may occur, that I may want to try to learn. Okay, first I need to make some assumptions about, about C as well, but these are usually not under my control. Sorry? 
Ah, that's a very good point. So, so of course, actually what I really want is that not H is a subset of C, but that C is a subset of H. <laughs> I mean, if I'm in a good situation, that's what we call proper learning. So proper learning means that any C can be, I fi can find an H which, which met here, meet, meet it. Okay, so if C, if C, I usually, this curly C, in the concepts class, is a subject of my hypothesis class, then every function that I occur, I can find a, a good approximation, a perfect approximation in my hypothesis class. Okay? So this, this is the situation where we call it proper learning. In this case, I can actually bring the error on my data at least, well actually the actual error of my sample, of my class, to, to zero. I mean, I can perfectly match the, the function. Okay. Usually this is not, not only not guaranteed, it's not even true. I mean, not even closely true. I mean, so we actually have to approximate. So we're looking for the best approximation in my class to the, to the true function. Okay. So what is the real problem? The real problem is that I don't see the function in all the points. I see only a sample of my function. So I see, so if, uh, let's say if my function is, uh, is this function, uh, and what I see is a certain sample of x's, x1, x2, whatever, x5, xn. I see a sample, and then I'm given a uh, y1, which is f of x1, and then maybe y2, which is f of x2, and so on. So I'm given a sample. So this is really in the strict sense of sample. I sample my function in some points. Okay. So obviously I need to assume something about the function if I want to, <laughs> to be able to learn something about it. So, so there is a big, a big the, the most important part of learning is not to learn the sample, but to learn the function. So what do I mean by that? I mean that I can generalize. Okay. So now I'm giving you a new point, I don't know, this one, Z, whatever. I want to be able to make a good prediction of this label, F of C. So the point is generalization. Which I'm sure you heard one way or another. What I mean by generalization is to be able to take a sample and predict the value of the function out of the sample. Okay, but that, you know, this is the essence of statistics all over the place. I mean, this is not new to you. We always wanted to learn things about out of sample from sample. So, so far there's really nothing new, except that I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to try to minimize as much as I can the assumptions about the distribution. Okay, so that's the, the point. So, first of all, what is how, how well my hypothesis which is here, captures the, the, the data. How would you measure it? Any ideas? Okay, so essentially what we do is we, so I, I just want, maybe I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a good place for an example. By the way, uh, Amir, Amir notes have a very, are written very well on this, so, so you should read it. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we, in the book, in the Hebrew book, we have uh, too little. But um, so ima imagine that we have. Uh, here's an example. This is the zero one uh, unit square in, uh, in R two, and imagine that my concepts are rectangles. This is the canonical example. Every every course in learning theory gives this, but it's still a good example. Uh, so uh, uh, imagine that my concepts are the uh, rectangles here. So rectangles parallel to the axis, no, just to make things simple. And, uh, and uh, so x, this is x, the, the points in the sphere. So every x is actually point x, y, or x1, x2. Okay, so it's a two-dimensional x1, x2, sorry, not y. And y is going to be 1 if my point is in, this, in the rectangle and 0 if it's not a rectangle. 
Okay, so, so points here are going to be labeled uh, 1, and points here are going to be labeled 0. Okay, so that's a simple, very simple scenario. So I'm giving you samples. I'm sampling my space. So in this case, samples are not points on the line here, but points in the two dimension, but it doesn't matter. Same, same idea. And I'm trying to guess, fr to find from the sample, right? so I'm giving you, so there are some points here and some points here and so on. I don't know. How. So the sample, what do I mean by sampling? There's a distribution over the, the instance page, so there's some distribution d of x. So there is a distribution, let's call it p of x, uh, it's usually somehow called d of x, but d of x is very confusing <laughs> for us. This is, it, it, there exists a distribution. I don't know what it is, but there is a distribution. Distribution on x. Okay? So when I say sample, I always mean I know there is a distribution from which I'm sampling my data. Otherwise, that doesn't make any sense. Okay? So I sample my data. And now what would you do? I'm trying to learn my rectangle. So the algorithm gets the sample, and maybe it gets the, the fact that this is a rectangle. OK, so this is what I call the hypothesis class in this case. OK, okay so let's say I gave you these points. I, I don't see the, the red rectangle. <laughs> what would you think the algorithm should do? So what is the reasonable algorithm for learning I know it's a rectangle, but I don't see it. It can be any rectangle in the street. In so what would you do? So you, you look for a rectangle, any rectangle, which is consistent with your data. OK? So in this case, uh, I don't know, this rectangle, for example, we label correctly all the points in there that are labeled 1, and, and 0, all the points that are not labeled 1. But maybe I, I can have this rectangle. This is e too easy, so maybe this rectangle. This is also a rectangle which is consistent. So it's not a rectangle, but if it's a rectangle, it's consistent with the, with the data, but it's inconsistent. I mean, there's no mistakes on my training error. So what, what do I mean by training error in this case? So I'm, this is the hypothesis I'm trying to generate right now. This is a good hypothesis for this data. Why? because it is uh, consistent with everything that I see. Okay. It's actually giving me a zero error on the training of error. Okay. So there's something which I, I, I call the error of the hypothesis on my sample. Okay. There are many other notations like E of age in the samples or whatever. So this is what I call the training error. <coughs> or the, the training, the error on the sample. What is it? So essentially, I can write it like this. This is the probability that on the sample I make an error. So it's 1 over m, the sum over my data of uh, the indicator function of y uh, minus or not equal to h of x. So actually, this is xi and yi. And whenever. So this i here is not information. It's maybe I should write it uh, as an indicator function, something like this. OK, so this is 1 where this is true, which means then y is not equal to h x, and 0 when this is not true. OK, this is what's called the indicator function of something. OK? So this is going to be simply counting the number of mistakes or the, the number of mislabeled points. Okay. So this sum is just going to be how many out of the m points you labeled correctly. You have labeled incorrectly. Now I divide it by m to make it between 0 and 1. OK? So in this case, this blue rectangle will have a 0 error on the data, because it's going to label correctly the points in the rectangle and correctly the points outside the rectangle. What do I actually want? I want something which is as close as possible to the rectangle, to the true rectangle, everywhere. Okay. So that the general, what this training error, the generalization error. Oh, let's call it I don't know training. Uh, don't actually, let's write it just as e hat. I don't know. This is something. 
I, I, I'm a bit, uh, the notations are, uh, are ugly. Yeah. Okay, E f of, the, of h on, on, the, on the sample, but it's actually a function of both the hypothesis and the sum. Yeah. Okay, so given an hypothesis, I know how to calculate the error. Simply count the number of disagreements on my data. Okay? Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. So now what will be the generalization error? Sometimes we call it, I call it EG. So what is this? Uh, uh, the EG of the, of the hypothesis, so the annotation is again really ugly. I should put the sample here and the hypothesis here. All right. So the, the, the error of an hypothesis is going to be what? So it should be the expectation over all possible. So this is, this is what? This is essentially is the expectation of my, of this, of this uh, disagreement function, y not equal h of x. This is expectation over, for h, but where x belongs to what we call the empirical distribution. So what is the empirical distribution is exactly the points of my samples. So remember, we talked about it already. Okay, so this is a, point, a distribution which is centered on my data. So I, I denote that, this is the, so p hat, just, to, just notation, p hat is the empirical distribution. And if you, if you really want to be formal, so p hat is essentially a sum one over m sum of delta of x minus xi, uh, where I go from 1 to n. So this is essentially, I center all my data, all my distribution on my points. And so this is my empirical distribution, okay. Where delta is a, a Dirac delta when you're talking about continuous variables and a whatever delta that you need uh, in the discrete space, chronic delta or whatever. Okay, so what is the generalization error? So this is going to be, Instead of the, this is an empirical mean of the, of the cardinality, I want it to be the true mean with respect to this distribution D of, uh, of the cardinality, of the disagreement function. So what is it here? What is the actual error here? In this picture. It's the measure of disagreement. So it's actually the measure of the area, this area, of course you all know that. So where do these two hypotheses disagree? Actually two types of errors, as you know. The blue one is then I labeled it one, which actually it was, should be zero. And the red one is when I labeled it zero, it actually it should be one, okay? So it's the, but I, so I'm getting, making some error with probability of this, of this uh, disagreement area. So the probability that I don't agree here is that I find a point which actually hits exactly the disagreement area. So, the disag so essentially, that denotes just for simplicity the, the C, the, the, the true the hypothesis by C, and my uh, hypo uh, the, true, the true function by C and my hypothesis with H. So in, in a set theoretic measure uh, uh, terminology, what is this uh, region of disagreement is, is essentially uh, what we call the symmetric difference between A and C. The symmetric difference is the, is the set of uh, A minus C plus C minus H in set theory. Okay, so it's exactly the region of disagreement. Okay, so, so essentially this is the measure of the disagreement between agency. This is a generalization error. So it's, it's the probability under this D that I'm going to find a point where the two concepts, the two functions disagree. Okay, so now comes the, so far everything is clear. Remember that the goal of learning is generalization. Just memory, memorizing the training data is not learning, it's memorizing. <laughs> So even if you think that in school you learn, if you don't generalize, you didn't learn anything. You need to be able to do things beyond what you actually saw. This is the goal, okay? Just memorization is not learning. 
Unfortunately, our exams are not very good at checking generalization, but they try. <laughs> okay? Now, um, so I care really about generalization error. And what is the problem? I don't see the generalization error. I see only the training error. Okay, so I need to prove something. <laughs> I need some sort of guarantee that my... What? I'm out of, uh, out of scale of time, excuse me. Only, we'll take a break in a second. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I need some sort of theorem that tells me under what condition I can guarantee when I know the training error, the generalization error is not too big. I, so I'm looking for what you call generalization bounds. And I want to be able to say it without assuming anything about the distribution D. So this is very different from the game of statistics. This is where it's different. I'm not assuming anything about distribution. And I want what I call distribution-free guarantees on the generalization error. Okay, so after the break, take, me, take 10 minutes to refresh yourself. We'll prove some theorems like this, okay? And I apologize for those who know this stuff, but I'm trying to say it interestingly even anyway.
the constant plus is where my function can come from. So this, uh, for example, this function uh, is uh, smooth and not too plus very, that is what we call the bending the function. Uh, it has the derivative is bounded. Okay, so this is some sort of a concept class. And the hypothesis class is what the algorithm generates. So the algorithm can have uh, its own uh, view of, or for example, I can learn, okay, I'll, I'll explain, okay, it's very cool. I, I, some people know this, and I'm not sure exactly, I'm trying to meet all of you. If you don't give me feedback, I don't know where I meet. So it's good that you ask. I'll try to explain it again. Okay. So you mean what do you assume about the functions that you actually get in the world? So okay. for example, I, this could be uh, ellipse, mm -hmm. or any function which is convex in the plane. So. So, for example, I can have something uh, like, uh, you know, let's say any any convex uh, function, something like this. Okay. Now this this could be my uh, no, let's put it in red. Okay. So uh, so my concept can be anything which is uh, close a convex set. Okay. Convex set. I mean that it contains all the points that the line between the point points. Okay. Convex. Now uh, this is not rectangles. Rectangles are special cases. But maybe my algorithm can only generate rectangles. So this, this, uh, the best rectangle that will do something like this. Uh, so this will be, uh, it's very different from the concept. But this is the best approximation maybe I can do for this particular object. So the concept plus might be much richer. Or maybe the concept plus is only the squares. I mean, rectangles with uh, equal size, which is a subset of all the rectangles. So this is, a, in this case, the hypothesis class is larger than the cosmic class. Because the hypothesis class was also rectangle. So it captures all the squares. But it doesn't capture all the convex sets. So in this case, the concepts are very different. This is a, this, this concept class with all the possible uh, shapes. And I can only approximate them by a rectangle. So I'm going to have an error which I cannot uh, minimize. And, 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 and I cannot get do better than that. But if my concepts are only all the rectangles, all the, all the squares, then I can easily learn them with the rectangle. So the concept class is what I want to assume about the functions that I'm actually trying to learn. And the process class is what my algorithm can generate. Uh, this algorithm generates rectangles. That's all you know. But the data can come from very different classes. Okay, so that's what it is. So you you actually taking these two courses? I mean, you uh, and uh, So I, sometimes I'm not really sure what the, what is the level of the question you're asking. Because yeah. you know more than I think than you used to show. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, the in previous exercise, you yeah. show the uh, I I I X Y I X Y. Uh, I don't remember. This this one? Uh, yeah. No 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 no. I X Y. What's here? I just read. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> So like uh, I X Y is come back in P X or come K in P X. You don't want it. Yeah. 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 I, I you don't remember this? Yeah. I this was an X class. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. this, right. but uh, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine. Could you draw the? Uh, it's not, it's not so if you look at I, so I X Y. No, no, no. I mean, I mean in one D, I, I can imagine. Uh, uh, so this is a, a function of P of X. And the P or Q or the Y given X. Yeah. So these two functions, if I know this and this, I know the joint solution. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So let's say that I know all these and don't know this. Mm -hmm. Then with respect to this variable, it's complex. Yes. Yeah. You can minimize. Yes. Yeah. But if I know this and don't know this, then it's complex. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what is the question? So, like, uh, you, you can you draw this, this thing uh, uh, based on these two variables? So, like, uh, 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 it's a three-dimensional multi-dimensional problem. Yeah, yeah it's a three-dimensional problem, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, this so is X okay. So, so in this coordinate, it looks like an entropy, something like this. Yeah. And in this coordinate, it looks like a in, in this problem. In this dimension, it's it's going like this, and this dimension going like this. This can happen. How 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 do you imagine? So so even in three dimensions, you can imagine that you know a saddle point. Yeah, yeah, so the saddle has a uh, concave cross section in one dimension and a concave cross section in the other. 
So it has, it has, it has a, a, a set of parabolas which are lying on a parabola. So, so, uh, I'm, I'm so this parabola is moving. It's hard to draw it. So I have many parabolas, but they are sitting on another parabola. So this is a saddle. Yeah, I'm sure you saw it. I mean yeah, yeah. So I I I if, if you look at a function like x, x, the function of x y, which is x squared minus y. Okay. Okay. So for every given y, okay. this is a parabola in x. Okay. This this type of problem. But for every given x, this is a parabola in y. This type of problem. So in x y, it's it's a uh, it's a sub. Okay. Okay. And it, so this can happen. Yeah. Think about draw this function in MATLAB, okay? okay. And you see what happens. Okay. Okay. I, I unfortunately in my three dimensional drawing is much worse than my two dimensional drawing, which is not very good either. Okay, so we want to continue. And again I'm saying I just re want to give you some basic high level ideas of the theory. The details should be learned in the theory of course. Okay, so again, uh, I, I must apologize for doing this uh, in one class. Usually, in front of the, usually we have two weeks for that. I'm still missing the Christmas class, <laughs> although I'm extending it as much as I can. But so, uh, so there was a question here uh, that I really need to answer all of you. So, imagine so what is the difference in the contrast hypothesis? So, imagine imagine that my my algorithm is generating rectangles in the unit square, which means that it's actually generating two points, this one and this one, and then I can uh, re re draw a rectangle. This is what my algorithm knows. So, this is the hypothesis class. But imagine that my concepts were all the possible convex uh, subsets of the square. So ellipses and circles and triangles and whatever you want. <laughs> convex sets. Or anything like this. So in this case, my algorithm can only approximate it. So let's say my concept was this uh, funny shape. I can find a, a rectangle which will minimize the disagreement, the area of mismatch, the, which is exactly this, uh, this measure, the, the symmetric difference. Okay. Now, uh, in this case, the hypothesis class is smaller than the concept class. So there are many concepts which, of course, it can also generate rectangles, but there are many concepts which I cannot perfectly match. Okay. So there's going to be an error even after I optimize, even in the best hypothesis that I can generate, this, there's going to be an error. Okay. On the other hand, let's say that my hypothesis, my concepts are actually all the squares which are rectangles with equal uh, size. Yeah? So uh, in this case, of course, I can find a rectangle which will match the square perfectly. So in this case, the concept class is subset of my hypothesis class. OK, so in principle, these two things are very different. I want, I want this for what I call proper learning, because only then I can really minimize the error to zero, the generalization error. OK, the training error, I may be minimized in some small sample. So even if the training error is zero, the generalization error is usually can be larger. We actually, it's always eventually larger. It depends uh, how you average. Okay, so our goal is to guarantee something about generalization error. So this is this comes into into under a very general model of learning, which we call puck learning. Puck. How many of you heard about it? Same people. <laughs> Five. Okay. So Puck Learning is standing for this funny funny name, probably approximately I'm more or less uh, my spelling is term approximately correct. Yeah, okay. So uh, probably approximately correct and it sounds funny. But it, <laughs> it actually has a, a very concrete sense which I want to explain now. So I want to guarantee with high probability. So why, why do I need this? Because I'm getting a sample. So remember, you are getting a sample from the data. 
this sample can be, as you already know, we talked about this early, earlier in the course, samples can be, with, high, with small probability, what we call non-typical or bad. I can get, you know, here, for example, I can get a sample which will give me all the points here. Okay. There's a probability that this happens. Okay? In this case, I'll, I have uh, very little information about the rectangle as long as I'm... So any rectangle which doesn't give <laughs> zero to these points is going to be... This is a very bad sample. So, so there is some sort of... Even after I sampled the data, there's some probability on the sample that, that there's a probability that I have a bad sample. So this is where the probability comes. The probability is essentially going to be a probability on the sample. With high probability, the hypothesis I'm going to generate is going to be correct, okay? But I'm willing to separate, to, to settle it, not with perfectly correct, which is approximately correct, which means I want to bound the probability of error. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain it in a second. So essentially there are two numbers here. This, the area of the mismatch, or the measure, actually it's not the area, it's the measure under this hypothesis, uh, under this distribution, which may not be uniform. Be very crazy, any distribution. The measure of the mismatch area is my probability of error. Okay, so this is, this is, uh, this is the probability that I'll take another sample at random and I'll uh, misclassify it. This is what I want to minimize. Okay. So now the question, so this, by, by the way, there is a lot of literature and a lot of people I should mention here who contribute this model. The pack learning model is, was essentially uh, formulated this way first time by Les Valiant, who's a very famous computer scientist at Harvard. And uh, also interested in the brain, by the way, and has a very famous book called The Circuits of the Mind, which I believe is completely wrong, but it's actually very interesting. Uh, but uh, anyway, so so uh, the so Valiant formulated this model in a very simple sense. So what what do I want? I want to guarantee that the probability of misclassification is small. And I want to ask what is the minimal number of samples that will give me this guarantee. Okay, so in principle that's very easy. You throw this uh, point at random, and I think about dots, I don't know, you throw them at the board, randomly, and what is the probability of hitting this? So it's the area. So I want to guarantee that the mismatch area is smaller than epsilon. Okay? So I, given an epsilon, again, what I'm doing is not informally, but I hope clear. So given an epsilon, greater than zero. I, I want to guarantee that the distribution, I want the measure of the symmetric difference, which is the dash arrow, to be smaller than epsilon. Okay? This is what I want. And this is the notion of approximately correct in this case. I'm good enough, give me any epsilon if you guarantee that the probability of mismatch of, of misclassifying a, a new point is smaller than epsilon, I'm fine. Okay, now I want the condition on the number of samples that will, if I fit them, I'll actually guarantee this. Okay, so that's very simple. So the probability of hitting a point for, so let's say that this particular age is bad, is epsilon bad, for a given age, so given age, given an hypothesis, uh, the probability that age is bad is that uh, is uh, that I, uh, the probability this this age survived a sample of size m of independent samples. What is it? So the probability the probability of this age is what I call epsilon bad. So epsilon bad means that it has an error. So this is just the definition. So age epsilon bad if uh, d of age c is greater than epsilon. Okay? Which means it's, it's further away more than epsilon error. Okay? This epsilon and this epsilon are the same thing. Sorry. Epsilon. 
Okay, so uh, so this is what I call epsilon beta. So what's the probability that H is epsilon epsilon bed with M? So is, is, is epsilon bed, but H is consistent with 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 M samples. Or in other words, this is just saying that the training error of H on the sample of size M is zero. Okay. So this is uh, essentially saying, like, what is the probability that an epsilon bed hypothesis survived M samples? So what is this? So this probability, this probability is bounded by one minus epsilon to the M. Is this clear? Okay, let's look. What's the probability that uh, I miss the, 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 bed, the bed zone, the mismatch zone with one sample? One minus, it's less than, it's uh, greater than one minus epsilon, okay? So, the, uh, sorry, uh, so the, if this is smaller than epsilon, the probability that I miss it is less than one minus epsilon, is greater than one minus epsilon, okay? It's confusing a little bit. I want, the probability of hitting this by chance is the area which is smaller than epsilon. So the probability that I miss it is greater than one minus it. Okay? The, the probability that I, hate that I miss it m times is less than one minus epsilon to the m. It's a probability that all the m independently miss this area. Okay, so this is a bound, an upper bound of this probability. Okay? Okay, that's nice. But the problem is that this was true for one particular age. This one. <coughs> Now my algorithm is going to generate an edge which is consistent, so this is consistent with the, with the sample, it's actually an algorithm which we call empirical risk minimization, or ERM. So let's say that my algorithm is doing the trivial thing, it's going all over the edges and, and give me one which is consistent with my data, just as I did. I mean, I found one rectangle, but there are many rectangles here that are consistent with my data, okay? So I want to guarantee that any one of those algorithms that I thought is consistent with the data are, are, are not too far away from the true one. So I actually want to ask a different question. What is the, the probability that there exists an hypothesis in my hypothesis class, and that's where the hypothesis class in, comes into the game, which is consistent with the data, which means it has a zero training error, but is epsilon bad, which means it has on its own larger. So I want age which is which have uh, such that the probability that exists that is such that E empirical of age on, on the sample is zero. And age is epsilon b. Okay, it's a lot of words, but this is essentially I know that for a single one it's one minor epsilon. So here I'm using something which we call the union bound. So essentially, this probability is a probability that, age, that the first age is, is consistent and that's from and so on. So let's assume for a second, not for a second, for a few minutes, that age is finite. The cardinality of age is finite. So I actually could go through all the possible hypotheses and, and make sure that the first one is, 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 the first one is, is good and not that so on. So this is, the probability of this set, H1 is bad, H1 is not bad, H2 is not bad, and so on, is bounded, it's a, what you call, it's a, it's a probability of a union of events. This, and this, and this, and this, or this, or this, or this, and so on. This is bad, or this is bad, or this is bad. So here, it is what we call the union bound. So the probability of a union of events is bounded by what? I think we mentioned it already. So the probability of a union of events, probability of a union of some events, whatever I is, is always smaller than the sum of the probabilities of those events. And this is called the union bound. Okay, so this is the very basic things in probability, but think about it. I mean, if my events are, uh, if, so this is an event, this is an event, this is an event, so, so that's a subset of some uh, instance space. So the probability that I'm 
in any of them is less than the, the sum of those probabilities. If they are disjoint, then it's exactly the, the sum. But usually that does, it does disjoint events. So it's only, remember one of the first actions of probability is that probability sums over disjoint events. If not does disjoint, there's an overlap. So it's only smaller than this. That's all it is. Okay, so this is known as the union bound. So I want to apply the union bound here. So the probability that exists a probability is smaller than the sum is smaller than the sum, this is the union bound of all the ages in my class, of one minus ep epsilon to the m. So this is the probability that one of them is bad, and this is the union bound. But what is this? I'm out of space. <laughs> but this is exactly, this is smaller than the cardinality of the space, or exactly the cardinality of the space, times one minus epsilon to the m. So let me, let me write it somewhere more carefully. Okay, so we get something quite uh, simple and quite elegant. So again, let me write it then. And the probability that there exists an epsilon age in my class which is both consistent with the sample and epsilon bad is bounded. This is what I want to minimize. Because if I bound this probability, then my algorithm will not, we cannot generate a too bad. I thought it because the, the, the best that my algorithm can do is go all of, over all the possible hypotheses and find the best one or find someone which is consistent with the data. But this was bounded by the cardinality of my class. So the cardinality of my class is the number of hypotheses in my class, and I assume this is finite at this point, multiplied by 1 minus epsilon to the n. Well, that's very nice. So this is the, the, the approximate part of the approximately correct, the epsilon. But now I, I want to guarantee that this has a small probability, okay? So I want this to be smaller than some no number delta, and which I call the confidence. Okay, so this I really want you to remember. If you look at my exams, I always ask something about this thing. Always. <laughs> something about the difference between the accuracy. So this is what we call accuracy, which is essentially generalization error. Yeah, it's always, I mean, the, the, the accuracy or the approximately correct accuracy, this is the, approx <laughs> the A part of the, the pack. And this is what we call confidence. So it's confidence in the sense that if this is small, I am in high confidence. You can write it that the probability that I'm correct is m larger than 1 minus L. So this is good. Okay. So what does it tell us about M? This is really what I'm interested in. What, how many samples I need to make sure that this is true? Okay, so this is a very simple equation. You take the log. So you see that uh, it essentially it means that log, uh, log cardinality uh, minus, uh, okay, log cardinality plus uh, m log of 1 minus epsilon and should be less than uh, log uh, delta. Uh, that's not so nice because delta is smaller than 1. And so you rearrange it. <laughs> this is a negative number, so the other things. You rearrange it, and you remember, so this is both, this is negative, and this is negative, and this is positive. So after playing with it a little bit, what you get is that, so, yeah, so, uh, okay, I, so I get that, uh, um, so log minus epsilon, log of uh, minus log of 1 minus epsilon is less than epsilon. If you don't believe it, uh, draw a log. And uh, notice that uh, this line, uh, so epsilon, 
Yeah, so, so log of x is less than uh, x minus 1. So use this and generate this. It's all right. <coughs> okay, so uh, because uh, okay, I'm talking lan, okay, just to make it simpler. So it's, uh, it's uh, the, the tangent. I already used this once in the course, if you remember, <laughs> this inequality. So uh, after playing with it, what I get is that uh, epsilon is bounded by log of the cardinality of h over delta divided by m. Or if you want, m should be larger than log of this cardinality of h over delta divided by epsilon. So these two things are equivalent. Okay, so if m is larger than this number, I'm fine. This is over delta, yeah. Ah. This is slash. Uh, <laughs> I'm just okay, so it's one. If you want log of plus plus log of one over delta. Cardinality of h plus log of uh, one over delta. So, so verify this. This is easy. Use this inequality and verify it. Okay. Yes. No, epsilon is smaller than one. Epsilon and, epsilon and delta are both smaller than one and greater than zero. Okay. This is always true. Because this is a lot smaller than one number. <laughs> so it's a, it's a negative number. Uh, never mind. Just remember this. This is the only thing you need to remember that the slope at the origin is one. At one, it's one. Is one, and the the tangent is always above the log. Okay. This is I, I wanted to play with it a little bit to so get this. So we got actually very nice type of bounds, which are typical for this. Yeah. I'm wrong somewhere. No, this is the right inequality, but why, what's where, where am I wrong? Um, <coughs> I want m to be louder than something, not smaller than something. And here I want uh, epsilon to be smaller. And both of them are positive. No, no. Okay, forget about this for a second. This is certainly true. So uh, I'll, I'll check it. Uh, both of them are true. I, I just don't see the. Where am I wrong here? Essentially, epsilon is bounded by some number over m. When m gets larger, epsilon gets smaller. And I need m to be large enough to make epsilon smaller. Just about this. Okay. So essentially, the error, the generalization error, remember, this is the probability of the mismatch. So the generalization error is bounded by the log of the cardinality of my class divided by the number of examples. This is the typical bound that we get for what you call zero training error, actually perfectly match my data. Now remember that if, I don't, if my hypothesis class doesn't contain the concept class, I may not be able to do this because I, 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 because I cannot perfectly match my data, and then I need to, to use a slightly diff this is what we call improper learning, and then instead of doing this, I'm using a slightly different uh, argument. It's not really slight. It's I'm using what we call the churn of bound. We already mentioned it, I think. So I'm I'm, I'm using the, a bound on the difference between the empirical error and the expectation of the empirical error, which is the generalization error. And uh, and so this is uh, what we call empirical convergence. I mean, so you know that with m is large enough, the empirical error is going to concentrate around the generalization error. Because the average, again, this is important to understand, the average training error is the generalization error if I average over the samples. If I take many samples, it's just like taking a very big sample, which is essentially averaging the training error, or going with the training data to So the average 
The, training er the expectation of the training error is generalization error. Now, it's so it's going to concentrate like everything that we said, I mean, like a Gaussian eventually around the mean, where the standard deviation goes like what? Like what? Like 1 over square root of n. Okay, so this is what we call the churn of bound. And this gives me, so if there is an error, the only thing that I can bound is the difference between the generalization error and the training error, oh, what I, I call H, H et of SM. And I know that the, the probability that this is greater than epsilon is actually less than e to the minus uh, epsilon square over 2m. So this is going to replace this very simple uh, uh, calculation. And this here I'm actually using what we call the chain of bound. So this is something very, very fundamental in, in learning theory. We use it all the time. Uh, because this, is, this essentially is an important bound, which is telling me how much an expectation empirical mean of a size m is differs from the expectation of this empirical mean. By the way, this is true for any function which is a sum averaged over the sample. As long as, long as the sum, this function is bounded, this is true. So it's up to the, the scale of... So the, the, there's a scale here. In, th in this case, these this, uh, numbers are are um, for the one, I mean, they're both between zero and one, so, but if the scale is, let's say, 100, I have to multiply by 100, otherwise it's exactly the same argument. So as long as I have a bound, bounded average of some function, uh, this, is an this, is, this, is, this is why the churn of bound or some variations of it, it's one-sided, two-sided, there are all sorts of variations to this, but this is really what you have to remember. So this, this tells you but instead of bounding it like 1 minus epsilon to the n, we, uh, this is bounded by e to the minus epsilon square. Now, the epsilon, e to the minus epsilon square comes from the Gaussian distribution. This essentially is the, the weight of the, of the tails of the Gaussian. So if you remember, or you maybe don't remember, but if, if I have a Gaussian distribution, and I ask what is the probability that a variable is a few standard deviation away from the mean, it goes like e to this deviation to square over the standard uh, over the number of examples of the sample. So this is the, the variance here, or if you want the standard deviation square, this is sigma square m of the Gaussian, and this is the deviation from the mean. So uh, that's all. That's all it is. This is general bound. Yeah. That's right. That's only for proper learning. No, but no, no. But this, so this is replacing this part. So if I now use the, the again the the if I use again, I'm sorry, this, the board here is so is so tricky. So if I use the, the same argument again, I get that epsilon is less than the log cardinality of h plus log of one over delta. So this is again the h and delta that I had before divided, but instead of m, I, I get epsilon square here, and I get 2m here. That's the only difference. The epsilon square came from the exponent of the Chernoff, from here, and the 2m comes <laughs> from this 2m. So it's very, I want this to be less than delta, and I do the same line of argument, exactly. Okay, so if this, if this is not absolutely clear, clear just go through it it's in, the, in the notes. So this is the, so in proper learning, I get actually a better bound. The epsilon looks like log h plus uh, log 1 over delta divided by m. This is proper, and this is general or improper. Okay, so this is slightly weaker. You see it's weaker because it means that epsilon goes like over 1, one over square root of m. So it goes slower to zero than the one over. <coughs> but that's not a big, big thing. This is what we call in computer science just a polynomial factor. I mean, it's not a big difference. OK, so this is nice. It's telling me something quite remarkable. I mean, the first time you see it, it's actually quite incredible. You don't need to know anything about the distribution d. As long as what? As long as it's a fixed distribution. Why? How does it happen? Because I use the same distribution to generate my sampling my training data, and to test it. 
So I, I throw my points at the same distribution with which I'm using in order to test it. If I'm changing the distribution in between, forget about it. The bound doesn't work. So this is very, very important for, you know, you do experiment, when you do something and you want to generalize, do this, use the same statistics during the training <laughs> that you use in the world. If you change the statistics, this whole thing collapses. Okay, but as long as I'm making the assumption that my sample, my training data came from the same distribution on which I'm going to test my, my hypothesis, then this is a very nice bound. Why is it so nice? Because nothing about the distribution here, it's only the cardinality of H. Okay, so now comes another important step in uh, pack learning. What happens if H is infinite? Again, I, I know that I'm squeezing it a little bit, but it's all right. So uh, if H, for example, here with the rectangles, there's no, uh, it's not, there's no finite number of rectangles, even in the unit square. How many rectangles are there? Quite a lot. <laughs> it's actually the, a continuum. Yeah, I mean, right? So essentially, uh, every two points here define the rectangle. So it's, it's what we call the measure of, uh, of the continuum, the, the, the real numbers. At least. It's actually, the real number square, but that's all right. <laughs> so there's actually four numbers here the x, y of, uh, of each, x1 and x2 of every of the two corners. So actually, there are only four numbers here. So you, you may feel that something something like four dimension should come here. I need only to estimate four parameters, essentially. But so what is the trick? I mean, how can I move from a finite cardinality class, where this makes sense, because if the cardinality of H is infinite, then this bound doesn't make, make any sense, okay? It's too big. So I want to replace the class with something which is approximate to the class. How would you do that? It's still finite. So this is a very important idea, which I already mentioned, actually, in some other context, in the context of red distortion. I don't know where. I think I mentioned it here. Okay, forget about this for a second. So well, let's say that I, my hypothesis is not all the possible rectangles. I want some finite, what you call, compression or approximation or cover. It's all the same line of ideas. So what would you do? I mean, if you're in... Uh, or whatever, <laughs> very, very young, and you're trying to, and you have uh, those uh, pages with squares on them. <laughs> you remember the Pechesh Bon? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so those things, usually if you have to write, to draw a right angle on this page, what would you do? You pick the, <laughs> the, the grid, okay? That's what we would, I would do at least. It's so you pick only, only rectangles which are on the grid. Okay, so what is nice about the grid is that it's going to make this continuum into a finite space. So essentially, imagine now that I'm actually having a grid here. Okay, my uh, drawing ability is going to exhaust itself very quickly. Okay, so a grid, yeah, you know what I mean. And, 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 w and I want this grid to be dense enough such that every rectangle will be close enough to a rectangle on the grid, not more than epsilon away. I can always do that. So for example here, if this is the grid, okay, this is a very, a very close grid, <laughs> I can pick uh, this rectangle, I don't know, on the grid, this is on the grid, and it will be not as good, but if I make the grid dense enough, I still have a finite number of rectangles because the grid is finite. I mean, I divided the compact space into a grid, so there's a finite number of points on the grid. And now imagine that I align my rectangles just to lie on the grid. So my hypothesis is not generating all the possible grid, but only some grid approximation. So imagine that my hypothesis, <coughs> my our algorithm is generated rectangles with uh, rational numbers with denominator which is not more than uh, one over a thousand. Okay, so essentially just two decimal points, or three decimal points. So this is a very dense grid, I'm not going to draw it, but then I know I can actually prove that my grid is not more than one over epsilon square or something like this, one over epsilon plus one over, one over a thousand, one plus one over a thousand, because this is a, at most the, the bend of this grid here and here. So, so I can bend the, the approximation. 
Okay, so in order to save this argument with an infinite class, what I need is an epsilon cover of my hypothesis class. This is what stands behind it. So an epsilon cover, so this grid is essentially what we call an epsilon cover of H. So this is a very deep statement <laughs> in some sense. If I could approximate all my hypotheses by just points on the grid, as I can do with this rectangle, it's very easy with this rectangle, then I know I choose some hypothesis from the grid, and, uh, and they are not far, so they are epsilon away from the true one, and maybe there's another epsilon, so I'll be two epsilon away, epsilon away from my approximation, so I'll be two epsilon away from my true function, as long as my grid is dense enough. This is a very important idea. I mean, we can al always approximate things by cov epsilon covers, by, by some finite covers. Okay, so now I'm asking you a very interesting question, and I have uh, three minutes <laughs> to give you another new idea. <gasps> so what is uh, the size of the grid, an epsilon grid? How many are there? Okay, think about it here. So let's say that this is some epsilon. I know. The grid is epsilon. So how many rectangles are there? So in this case, it's like choosing two points on the grid. So how many points on the grid are here? It's, it's 1 over epsilon square. OK? Points on the grid. Oh, so it's 1 over epsilon in one dimension and another 1 over epsilon in the other dimension. So yeah, so everyone and every point on the grid is actually characterized by 1 over epsilon square. OK? I need to give you two coordinates. So there's 1 over epsilon here and 1 over epsilon here. I need to tell you which one. OK, now, but in order to specify a rectangle, I need two points, the two corners. Now, this sounds like a very specific argument. Actually, it's the most general argument you can imagine. It's always the same argument. Just have to need so I need to give you two points of the rectangle. So how many coordinates? How many are there? 1 over epsilon square times 1 minus epsilon square. Or in other words, 1 over epsilon to the fourth. Yeah, you're right. I, I counted some uh, twice. Yeah. So it's over 1 over 2, half of that. OK, never mind. This is a bad factor <laughs> which I can ignore. So what is really important is this 4. So the, the size of the cover is, uh, is scaled like 1 over epsilon to some number. In this case, it was 4. Why 4? Because there are actually 4 coordinates, 4 numbers that specify a, rectang a rectangle. Now, if, if, this were, is, if these were actually circles and not rectangles, what would you do? So then it's actually the center and the radius, which is uh, a little less. 2, 1 over epsilon plus another number. It actually would be three variables. So in general, and this is a very general statement, if, if H is in some sense finite dimensional, in a very specific sense, then the cardinality of H, I, I can find what I call an epsilon approximation, or an epsilon cover of H, which is precisely like this grid. I mean, I can cover my space with approximate rectangles. And what I know is that the size of this cardinality is going to be proportional to 1 over epsilon to some dimension. In this case, the dimension was 4. 